Welcome back to When Stars Fill Half the Sky, a novel by Pete Caputo. This is Chapter 19, Reunion, as read from Michael Fiveland's memoirs. The worst part was not knowing how or when they would come. Even the best protection the U.S. government could offer us held little assurance. The collective was too cunning. When they put their minds to it, nothing could stop them. After all, they'd stayed one step ahead of their adversaries for practically all of human history. The president's security team devised a bait-and-switch plan, bringing in body doubles for the Nelsons, a pregnant-looking Julie, a Sebastian double, and a doppelganger for me. Then, a Faraday cage the size of a 40-foot RV was built to shield us from any detection. This lead-lined living quarters was outfitted with its own life support, climate control, and sanitary systems. They moved us to another undisclosed spot in Area 70, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Days passed, days turned into weeks, still nothing. We started to get on each other's nerves. Julie's mother took it the hardest, prone to a predisposed case of claustrophobia. One morning, after spilling her breakfast plate, she simply lost it and started screaming uncontrollably to get out. General Nelson had enough, and he ordered that he and his wife be extracted from the Faraday cage. The seal was broken, and the couple walked out on their own. Julie, Sebastian, and I looked on silently. New, fresh air intermingled with our recycled atmosphere. The same air molecules repeatedly washed, cleaned, and reprocessed for weeks now. Smells of outside humanity and community wafted past our nostrils with hints of foreign body colognes and the faint aroma of hamburgers and french fries from a cafeteria almost 200 meters down a long sterile corridor. We wanted to run out with them, to leave our prison and rejoin the rest of the world. Damn the safety protocols and risk of capture. It would be worth it just to not have to be sealed up again for God knows how much longer. But the door was instantly resealed. I looked at Julie. She stared back through eyes brimming with tears, but those eyes maintained a steel, emotionless sense of resolve. Words were not necessary to convey her commitment to do everything possible to assure the safety of her son. Sebastian finally broke the silence. It will do no good staying in here. Eventually, they will find a way. The tests tentacles of the collective's influence are everywhere. Julie and I looked at each other for a second and then burst into laughter. Sebastian still had trouble pronouncing certain words. Although we knew he meant to say tentacles, it sounded like, well, you know. We welcomed the momentary vacation from the never-ending onslaught of impending doom I guess sometimes the mind simply reaches for relief in any way it can. The hilarity lasted for about two minutes. Finally, as we wiped the tears of laughter from our eyes and drew heavy breaths of relief, we looked at Sebastian, who was not partaking in our emotional recess. Something was heavy on his mind, and no brief stint of levity could shake him from it. With deadpan seriousness, he looked at us and said plainly, They're here. With that, a concussive thud was felt. It shook the entire container. The magnetic locks that sealed the Faraday cage were blown. The doors flung wide open, and in stepped four figures, all dressed in black, donned with self-contained breathing apparatus. Behind them, gunshots were echoing down the hall. They approached cautiously. One of them threw a small canister toward us. Gray smoke instantly billowed from it. I threw my arms around Julie, who was already holding on to Sebastian for dear life. But with the first whiff of that neuro-arresting agent, we all lost consciousness. 
Julie and I awoke hours later restrained in chairs aboard a military-type aircraft flying back to Switzerland. They placed us almost 10 meters apart from each other, and so, with the ambient noise of mid-air flight dragging across the outer hull of that stark, empty fuselage, there was no way for us to physically communicate. However, it did not impede our Morisel connection, and so we commiserated. Michael, I can't sense him, she said as we sat quietly with eyes closed. Our Morisel fragments were glowing brightly. Me either. He's not on this plane, that's for sure. There were two other people in our immediate area. A large framed woman who appeared to be a medical technician of some kind. She was monitoring our vitals and observing our glowing Morisel samples. The other was a physically fit Asian man, appearing to be in his mid-twenties. He was dressed in the same black gear the attackers wore during the raid earlier. I was able to read both of them fairly comprehensively. He was named Nico. He was one of the agents who broke into the cage. The woman's name was Grundel Lipschinger, a doctor of neurological medicine from the University of Zurich. They were both recruited by the collective fully implanted and indoctrinated into the NWA culture and directives. Their loyalty to the NWA ran deep, as was the case for most individuals who had since received bioelectronic implants years earlier. By now, their Nilka flesh connections had been fully integrated into their central nervous system. Voluntary and some involuntary motor functions were controlled by the will of the collective. Still, no one was privy to our Morisel conversation. Their technologies could do nothing more than observe the energy spikes from our glowing body parts. Where is my son? Julie demanded. Nico just stared at her blankly and said nothing. I need to know. Where is he? Have you no regard? No sense of decency? Are either of you parents? Do you have kids? Think of what you'd feel like if someone came and ripped your child out of your arms. Please, just tell me he's all right. Your son is all right. Grundel finally replied with a hint of sympathy behind her heavy Swiss accent. That is all I will say. You will know more when we land. Julie implored further, but to no avail. She would not say another word. Finally, Nico had enough. He approached Julie and forcefully struck her across the face. I yelled in response, trying to pull myself free of my bonds to protect my wife. Nico responded with a swipe at me. I dared him to release me and try it again. He was not interested in taking me up on my challenge. Do you think the Half Realm will help us? What if we go back in together? Honey, I don't know. You just had a really tough time in there. Going back in might hurt the baby. What, the aging thing? Look, I know the baby's fine. You just have to trust me. Besides, you know you can't stop me. You realize that, right? I looked at her, took a deep breath, and just smiled. I knew it would be no use trying to stop her once her mind was made up. We both closed our eyes, and suddenly, we were back in. It was a brand new place in time, one we'd never been to before in any of our journeys. The setting was just outside San Francisco, standing in an open field atop a park facing the Golden Gate Bridge off in the distance. But it was more than the location that was new, for we knew instantly that this was the future. Twenty years into the future, more precisely. The ride was unpleasant, as if someone or something was reaching inside and squeezing our internal organs. I understood now how my mother's journeys into the future took such a toll on her body. The pain was disconcerting, yet somewhat manageable. The experience was extremely heavy and oppressive for another reason. 
the New World Alliance had finally wrested control over the independent governments and sovereign nations of the world. Gone were the red, white, and blue of the United States and the blue and gold of the European Union. Gone as well were the flags of Russia, China, and India, and all other developed countries of our planet. Only one flag remained. It was a deep purple-colored flag sporting a golden pyramid in the center, encompassed by an elaborate Florentine pattern. This was the flag of the New World Alliance. At first, the panorama of this futuristic landscape was amazing and noteworthy. We were there witnessing the manifestations of both superconductive engineering and Nilka flesh ingenuity joined completely together. Energy was no longer something controlled or regulated by large corporations, oligarchs, or governments. It was dirt cheap to generate it, produce it, and maintain it. It changed the way societies functioned. The old infrastructures were gone, replaced by the ever-increasing need for magnetic levitation devices of all kinds. Jobs hindered by the limitations and restrictions of gravity were now a thing of the past. A new type of societal structure was emerging where entrepreneurs and investment groups existed only to facilitate this new paradigm. And the NWA controlled it all through the omni-neural network established decades earlier. The Prophet 10,000, now once again fully restored and in operation for the last 12 years, had spread its network into every corner of the globe and had become the brain for all communications, all record keeping, and every single financial exchange of any kind. Now it was simply referred to as Mother. But beneath the surface of this seemingly perfect world, a darker underbelly was quickly being revealed to us, and it wasn't hard to see, for it was pasted on just about every face. Almost everyone walked around with zombie-like expressions, blankly fulfilling predetermined tasks and directives. And wherever we went, that same void and vapid stare would greet us. There was a new leader on the world stage. He was a 22-year-old, handsome, black-haired young man with striking facial features and big blue eyes that peered right into your soul, inviting you to come along on his mission to unite the world. His name was Sebastian Fiveland. Our knees buckled. The collective had finally achieved their age-long objective to win the hearts and minds of the human race, and they used our son to do it. The half-realm immediately moved us to Treasure Island, that little stretch of land in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. It had recently been converted into the North American capital of the New World Alliance. Directly in its center, rose a brand new 12-story complex completely surrounded by the latest defense and cybersecure technologies. There he was, in the presidential suite on the top floor, sitting at his desk as a host of servants, aides, and sycophants catered to his every whim. Among this cacophonous cloud of groveling humanity, the room was filled with holographic projections of even more minions, stooges, and clapping seals vying for Sebastian's attention. We entered, covertly as usual, but Sebastian immediately sensed our presence. He stopped what he was doing and looked up. Raising his right hand to silence everyone, he commanded, Leave me! Now! No one questioned. They simply filtered out of the room as quickly as possible. When the door was shut, he silenced all recording devices. We were finally alone with him. With the world shut out, Sebastian confidently and securely turned to us. He rose from behind that impressive executive desk and walked over to where we were standing. 
He focused on his mother. Julie was already an emotional wreck, in tears and sobbing steadily. She moved forward to touch him, but I held her back. Julie, don't. We don't know what will happen if we touch him. Remember, this is the future. I don't care. Just let me go. Oh, my boy. Sebastian opened his arms. Julie ran to him. They embraced. There was no adverse effect. It was as if we were completely integrated into that time and space, at least for the moment. I cautiously advanced and embraced both of them. You're not a part of them. You're still separate. I can feel it. No, they got what they were looking for without integrating me. All this has been made possible because of you, Mom. Me? But, but how? Oh, you're here from that day, the day they came for me in Area 70, correct? Yeah. We woke up on a plane heading for Switzerland. They took you from us, and we knew the only place we'd get answers would be in the... I, I know, I know, so you're here. Oh, there's so much you don't know. So much has happened since then. So much is about to happen to you in, in your time. Sebastian turned completely silent and deep in thought, as if contemplating every potential outcome affecting his current world as a result of this meeting. Julie finally broke the silence. Sebastian, tell us what happened to you. His eyes revealed decades of distance between us. His mind was not easily accessible as it once was. Our Morisel connection to Sebastian was compromised. For too long, he'd been nurtured and tutored by the collective, indoctrinated in their ways of thinking, their precepts, their politics. We were but an old memory to him, only now becoming clear like a long-lost video found while rummaging through the attic of one's mind. The world needs me, Mother. I have been groomed for this for many years now. The Collective has prepared me and entrusted me with the responsibility of restoring order to this dying planet. You both refused to completely conform to the Collective. They actually needed both of you more than they needed me. It was always the Morisel. That was all they desired. He stopped himself again, contemplating the global ramifications of continuing to bear his heart before his parents. He looked down and realized Julie was still pregnant with her second child. Is she here? Is she alive? Tears welled in Sebastian's eyes. He turned his head away. Sebastian, we just need to know if she's okay. Can you at least tell us that? Brigitte, he suddenly cried, lifting his gaze to the ceiling. A holographic image suddenly flashed before us. She was about 20 years old with flowing blonde hair and green eyes. Her chiseled cheekbones and dimpled chin reminded me of my mother. But there was a different light in her eyes. She was plainly dressed in a simple white blouse and tattered jeans, sitting at a computer terminal, working on what looked like a puzzle of some kind. When she heard Sebastian's voice calling, she looked up momentarily, tilted her head as a dog might do when hearing its master's voice, and then slowly she dipped her head back down. We both sensed it immediately that Brigitte suffered from Asperger syndrome. Sister, our parents are here. They have come to visit. Brigitte, they're here to see you. There was no response. Brigitte is severely disabled, yet highly capable. We use her to troubleshoot certain parts of the network. She has a keen sense of detecting imperfections and flaws in Mother. Oh, I'm sorry. You called it the Prophet 10,000. Like me, there's Morisel in Brigitte's body, but it's bloodborne and not localized to any specific mass or organ as it is with both of you. They've tried to work with blood samples from both of our bodies, but they've found no way to exploit the special effects and capabilities of our Morisel. The only choice they ever had was to keep us within their care. My role was clear, almost from the beginning, 
but soon after they diagnosed her disability, they had no choice but to keep her as near to me as possible. Through the years, she continued to only respond to me, but as my responsibilities became greater, I was left with no choice but to keep her in the care of others I could trust. She's comfortable and well taken care of in one of our southeast facilities near Miami. Finally, Brigitte turned fully toward us and called softly. Mom? Mommy? Fascinating, Sebastian commented. That's the first time she's ever called out for anyone except for me. What about the half-realm, Sebastian? Did you ever try to come back to visit us? He would not answer. He just lowered his head and pondered how this meeting might threaten the integrity of the time continuum. Although he did venture back a number of times, he was only a fly on the wall and could not engage us nor warn us in any way. For Sebastian, this was the first time in decades he was able to communicate with us. But even so, he had more pressing needs and responsibilities to calculate probable outcomes and alternate realities. I could see it in his eyes. More than a million possible scenarios other than the one that lay before us were flying past his consciousness. Realities that only he was able to observe, assess, and evaluate. He leaned back against his desk momentarily, for the toll was too much even for him. He shook his head, as if trying to liberate an emotion held in bondage for years under the oppressive weight of mental conditioning. Finally, he approached me and said something I thought I'd never hear him say. Dad, I love you, but I can't tell you anymore right now. Now go, both of you. I can't, I, I can't do this. Go, please, just go. Mom, I love you too. I'm sorry, so sorry. His response jarred both of us to the core. We were confused why he would want to leave after not having us in his life for the past 20 years. We implored, but to no avail. His mind was made up and completely set. Suddenly, that same pain, the pain we were able to manage up to that point, was now overbearing. We knew this journey was about to end. Our present reality included that cold metal fuselage of the plane heading for Switzerland, and it was all returning to view. But suddenly, Brigitte yelled at the top of her lungs, Mommy! Look at you! Look at what they did to you! Brigitte, no! Yelled Sebastian, but it was too late. Instantly, we were transported down to an underground level in that presidential building. There we saw the room that housed the latest iteration of the collective's Nilka Flesh computer. And here we learned it was Brigitte who named it Mother. In an adjoining room lay the form of a very old woman. She was stretched out on a bed, her long gray hair framing her aged face. A picture of me, Julian, young Sebastian, was mounted on the wall near the foot of the bed. It was a picture from our first Christmas together in Area 70. Monitors surrounding the frail body were alight with all kinds of vital signs and data. The Morricelle in her neck was glowing steadily and bright as it communicated flawlessly with that superneural processor. It was Julie. Somewhere in our future, she had finally joined the collective. In the next chapter, Michael wrestles with his creator and finally learns the most important lesson of his life.